bombing Port Stanley Airport. But first, that runway was hit by one of 21 bombs from a lone Vulcan bomber, flying from Ascension and being refueled seven times on the way. It involved coordinating a fleet of nine Victor air tankers to refuel themselves as well as the V-Force bomber. Operation Black Buck 1 was designed to prevent the airfield being used by Argentina's high-performance jets, confining them to mainland bases and severely limiting their effectiveness. Soon after the Vulcan turned north, the air controller on Hermes cleared his Harriers for takeoff. At the time, the number involved was kept secret, but it's now known that the raid was carried out by nine Harriers, four from Hermes and five from Invincible. One hundred and sixty miles further east, still dawn in Port Stanley. The Argentinian invaders had remained undisturbed here for four weeks. Then the Harriers swooped in. In classic figure of eight formation, they evaded anti-aircraft measures with surprise and speed. The whole raid lasted just over a minute, but there would be 500 more. They were too low to cause serious damage to the runway, but a fuel dump was set on fire and some buildings were damaged. The Sea Harriers returned virtually unscathed and were landed quickly, being short of fuel. In two other operations the same day, Sea Harriers had also attacked Goose Green destroying five Argentinian Pucaras. Later that day, three task groups of the Argentinian Navy were detected mounting an apparent pincer attack on the British battle group. The biggest threat was their flagship, the aircraft carrier Veinte Cinco de Mayo, with its eight Skyhawk fighter bombers. In the event, these jets were prevented from taking off by unsuitable weather. But the force also included two T-42 destroyers, sister ships to three in the British task group and armed with Exocet missiles. These were moving in two formations from the north. To the south, the nuclear-powered submarine HMS Conqueror had detected the third group led by the old cruiser Belgrano. The British had already warned that they would sink any Argentinian warship deemed a threat and reasoned that this might prevent their navy entering combat. Two Mark 8 torpedoes were fired. The Belgrano sank in 45 minutes with the loss of 368 lives, but the rest of the Argentinian navy took no further part. Its Skyhawks transferred to shore to fight at ranges that put them at a disadvantage. Conqueror's skipper, Commander Christopher Reeford Brown, explained his action. She uh, was a threat to the task force. She'd been steaming towards them, and I'd been watching her for a few hours beforehand, and uh, under direct orders, I went in and attacked her. Was it I think by doing so, um, although there was obviously loss of life on her, which I regret, I certainly saved considerable loss of life from the British task force. May the 2nd, HMS Sheffield on the horizon and on fire, hit by an Exocet missile. Launched by air 20 miles away, it took two minutes flying at the speed of sound. 24 men were injured and 20 died, 
most casualties caused by fire from unspent rocket fuel. The human cost was the result of economies. These T-42s had been shortened to save money, leaving no space for the sophisticated Seawolf missile system. It had therefore proved vulnerable to air attack, despite being specifically designed for anti-aircraft picket duty. May the 21st, seven weeks after the original Argentinian invasion, commandos of three brigade began landing at San Carlos. They were unopposed. The Argentinians had been convinced Britain would land close to the capital, Port Stanley, as they had done. And as men and material continued to pour onto the beaches, the Argentinians were encouraged to believe this by a series of diversionary raids. In the anchorage itself, there was little room for naval escorts. Most remained out in Falkland Sound as the May the 21st gun line to protect the landings against air raids. Canberra would take all day to disembark her Royal Marine Commandos. Giant Mexi floats brought in heavy equipment. Wessex and Sea King helicopters would lift over 400 tonnes of guns and stores before the end of the day. Ashore, men dug into the soft peat. This would be home for a week, and wet trenches would cause great discomfort. Combat engineer tanks carved out strong points, while troops settled in quietly, marvelling at the lack of opposition. It was to come from the air. Argentinian Skyhawk spearheaded mass strikes on the forces now assembled in San Carlos water. On Hermes, 130 miles from the beachhead, Harriers prepared to intercept. Despite only having 20 minutes on combat air patrol, the Harrier was responsible for downing 23 Argentinian aircraft, mainly with Sidewinder missiles. Ground defence rapier missiles picked up the action. There's an air battle going on to the north. Air battle to the north. Second Raider 5 at 0 miles west. I say again, the first Raider 4 0 miles west. The second Raider 5 0 miles west. Out. Two Skyhawks swoop over the beachhead the first of five hours of attacks by 60 aircraft. Almost always they came in low and fast, but this often prevented their British-made Mark 17 bombs from exploding. The anchorage had been chosen so that Argentinian aircraft would have difficulty lining up on individual ships. near misses and those of other ferries speeded up offloading of troops so that civilian vessels could rejoin the carrier group, allowing more warships in to defend the landings. The Argentinians lost 13 aircraft during these raids. In the coming week, 130 further sorties would be launched by the Argentinians. for HMS Yarmouth. She was one of the few gunline ships to emerge unscathed from Bomb Alley. HMS Antelope was hit on May the 23rd. Attacked by six Skyhawks, one of 12 bombs bounced off the sea, holding the ship but failing to explode. But it did explode during defusing, causing a fire. It took two hours to remove the crew, then the Seacat magazine exploded. Antelope's destruction again emphasised weaknesses due to cost saving. These Type 21s were originally conceived as low-performance ships for foreign fleets like Iran's, 
with a widespread use of plastics that aided the spread of fire. Another lesson was the urgent need for an integrated long and short range air and missile defence to combat saturation air attacks. And mass Argentinian air attacks continued. Dart missile hunts its prey before another attack homes in. Reconnaissance helicopters shelter from attack. As the escorts hit back, many ships were lucky to be hit by bombs which did not explode. The commando carrier Sir Lancelot was one, towed to safe anchorage for the bomb to be defused. News of mounting ship losses sharply increased political pressure for an early breakout on land. First, instead of using helicopters as the Argentinians expected, British troops walked to Port Stanley along three arduous overland routes. Second, two Paris swooped on the important Argentinian base at Goose Green, sparking progress that would lead to tragedy at Fitzroy. Goose Green was a turning point. The six-phase British assault quickly overran outlying Argentinian positions, but faltered at their main defence line. Two Paris commander was killed at Darwin Hill, then the Argentinians were outflanked at Boca House. Two Paris momentum then took them to the airfield as Argentinian reinforcements arrived, but after a fierce firefight, two para outflanked them. The battle lasted 15 hours, night and day, because SAS observers had been unable to assess the strength of Argentinian defences. The debris of the first land action, the only battle to spill over into daylight hours, with the disadvantage of fighting on the open Falklands terrain. Good infantry work and handling of weapons, without much outside support, had defeated a well-defended position. Yet despite the ferocity of the encounter, only 72 died, 55 Argentinians and 17 British. Bad weather prevented airstrikes until late in the battle. When they did come, Argentinian resistance crumbled fast. Their strong points fell because they'd been badly planned and were unable to afford themselves mutual protection. Only the final surrender revealed just how outnumbered the British forces had been. Over 1,500 Argentinians were taken prisoner, three times as many as expected. They didn't include their commander. He telephoned his orders from a safe house in Stanley. The presence of Pukara ground attack planes had discouraged the tactic of a helicopter-borne assault. They had also been used to drop napalm, a futile weapon in open territory. To the north, 4-5 Commando had begun the long trek into the mountains overlooking Port Stanley. Loss of helicopter transports when the Atlantic conveyor was sunk made